Ukraine, meaning Mr. Zelensky, does not want that. He wants escalation. He wants uh, a Western rescue. And he desperately needs to keep the war going in order to preserve his regime, as well, of, of course, as the money that's coming in. This is the Friends of History Debating Society. I am Gaius, John Batchelor. Germanicus is here, Michael Vlahos. We're in Londinium. It's 90 AD. Well, it's the spring of 91 AD. But we started in 90 AD talking about our empire, the Roman Empire, the might of Rome in the first century AD. And we're happy to talk about it all the way through till it ends somewhere in the second millennium AD. Right now, we're focused on the 21st century because the inheritor of the Roman Empire is the American Empire, self-effacing and mighty powerful. The American Empire is now entangled with two kinetic wars and a potential third and a potential fourth. I'm looking at East Asia as a potential. I'm looking at Israel to Iran and vice versa as a potential. We're focused on the Ukraine story because there's been news these last days since I spoke with Germanicus. Uh, the news is encapsulated in this headline within these hours. Zelensky, that would be the president of Ukraine, says Ukraine's, quote, getting stronger, end quote, in Kursk as his troops blow up second bridge. There's video for this. It would appear that the Ukrainians are destroying bridges that would have uh, uh, evidenced the Russian counterattack possibilities. But at this point, this is total fog of war. Everything we learn from the media has to be considered useful to the side that's giving the information out. Russian, Ukrainian, American, German. I mention all this because over the weekend, the Washington Post, no less, ran a headline saying that the Kursk offensive, if that's what it is, came at the moment there was preparation for ceasefire talks in Doha, Qatar, between representatives of Ukraine and at some point representatives of Russia. We can presume those talks are now not going to take place immediately and the offensive continues. Fog of war. Germanicus, I've put two things together. There's the diplom diplomatic side which was the rumor in the Washington Post and other distinguished publications in many languages of ceasefire talks. And then there's an offensive driving into Kursk, a storied city uh, now said to be evacuated or ordered evacuated by the Russian side for, for ends we don't know. The simple question is, what is Ukraine's goal that you can see? Good evening to you, Germanicus. Good evening, Gaius. The situation for Ukraine is dire. The Donbass front is unraveling, and it's unraveling in a way that suggests a calamity in the imminent future. Um, Russians are making gains day by day that they never have before in terms of the rate of advance and the inability of Ukrainian forces there to contain them. And in effect, um, Zelensky created a new front and a new offensive uh, toward Kursk uh, with one objective, and that was to seize the Kursk nuclear power plant and blackmail Russia and try and use it as leverage for some kind of a better position in any kind of negotiations. In other words, to give Ukraine a strong hand. I don't think it would have done that. I think it would have been even more disastrous. But the fact is, they weren't able to get to the nuclear plant or even close. And now they're in a position where, um, as Herr Hitler's forces were in the last gasp of the Wehrmacht in World War II, in the Battle of the Bulge, um, Ukraine has a big salient with twelve to 15,000 troops and many of its best forces, as in the Battle of the Bulge, many of the crack German forces that remained, like the SS, were thrown into the affair. And This is uh, what also called the Kursk, 
the curse uh, attack or the incursion, the salient you're talking about, correct, Germanicus? The, the salient is is a bulge, and it is effectively uh, the geographical representation of the ground that Ukraine occupies once its initial thrust lost impetus and was unable to reach the Kursk nuclear power plant. And so um, Zelensky has decided to keep throwing more forces in. And so the, the last and best strategic reserve of the Ukrainian army is engaged there. And it is in a very parlous situation for the longer term. And yet the effort here is to escalate. Certainly it would have escalated to some sort of um, moment of truth had Ukraine seized the Kursk power plant. Having failed to do so, however, there are still gambits that can be exercised to, to escalate the war and this is the last hope of the Zelensky regime, because if the front collapses in Donbass completely, then Ukraine will collapse and Zelensky will be no more. And so what's interesting now about this Kursk offensive is it turns out how much Britain has played a role in developing the planning and in feeding British equipment to Ukraine and in supporting them in this effort. And I think the, the British desire for escalation uh, dovetails with that of Zelensky. Escalation is not intended to move everything toward World War III. Rather, it is intended to create an urgent situation that will force America's hand so that the US will step in powerfully to save Ukraine and to open up the floodgates, whatever is left behind those floodgates, to um, boost Ukrainian military power and to uh, create the basis for a more favorable uh, set of peace terms in any negotiation. Let me read some headlines from London. Germany plans to cut Ukraine aid to just 6% of current total. That's one headline. It's stated, uh, that's the English translation out of a German Frankfurter, Frankfurt report. Also, Ukraine, quote, heading for partial ceasefire talks before Kursk offensive. Germanicus, it's not logical that they would launch this offensive knowing that they were due in Doha to talk about a ceasefire. So your your explanation of desperate also it puzzles me because the administration in Washington and the NATO leadership would have known or should have known that Ukraine was massing troops for an offensive and made nothing of it. We've got a lot of questions I can't figure out. No, there, there are too many questions and we have no capacity here between us to even come close to answering them. However, imagine what the motivation might be to stopping those talks. Now, the negotiation was not for an end to the war, for ceasefire, for settlement. It was a very narrow um, set of talks proposed by Qatar uh, in which uh, both sides would come to terms regarding the destruction of their infrastructure, respectively, their energy infrastructure, uh, so that Ukraine would not attack right. Russian oil production and refineries, and Russia would not attack the electrical grid of Ukraine, which seems to be a great bargain for Ukraine to pursue. But I think the problem is this. Once we, have, we have one minute, Germanicus. Go ahead. Pretty simple. Once Ukraine agreed to enter into negotiations, no matter how narrowly cast, they would then be party to what the U.S. wants, which is to lock in a negotiation process to uh, extricate the U.S. from any kind of failure that might come 
if Ukraine continues the war. Ukraine, meaning Mr. Zelensky, does not want that. He wants escalation. He wants uh, a Western rescue. And he desperately needs to keep the war going in order to preserve his regime, as well, of, of course, as the money that's coming in. So th this is not too unlike what's going on with Israel, in which all of the ceasefire atmospherics were thrown overboard by the assassinations because Mr. Netanyahu also does not want an end to the war, also because his hide is on the line. Germanicus is Michael Vleos. I'm Gaius John Batso. We're in Londinium. It's peaceful here. The Thames is a little choppy, but it's late springtime, and you would expect autumn to sneak in. Oh, we're extremely confident and secure, surrounded by retired centurions, and their families have gone on home now for supper. The emperor is far away. He's deeply troubled. His name is Domitian. He's the second son of Vespasian, who triumphed in the year of four emperors. We're headed to the year of five emperors. That would be Mr. Biden and the four candidates for the executive office in 2025. And we are discussing the Roman Empire in the 21st century called the American Empire. Yes, the Americans deny they have an empire, but we Romans can see it clearly. The institutions, the architecture, for heaven's sakes, the law, the understanding of the legions. We Romans understand that you deny as long as possible that you're interfering in any local disturbance. You have a light footprint. Uh, you call yourself an embassy but you're operating either hostile to the regime in place or helping the regime in place with your purposes. Roman model works for the Americans. However, the Americans are now entangled in two conflicts where they tried that light footprint and it didn't work. That would be Ukraine and Gaza. Gaza looks to be closing down in some fashion. No major combat has been reported for days. The Hezbollah story is otherwise. We, we set that aside because we're concentrating on what's going on in Ukraine and how that affects or doesn't the current campaign underway. So we turn to the American presidential campaign where Cleopatra, that's the closest model we have. We're Romans. We're stuck with our models. They work for us. Cleopatra is on the campaign trail and doing well. Uh, cover of New York Times every day. Uh, making proposals for intervention in people's finances to the, helping with the mortgage, helping with childcare, helping with medical care, all very beneficial to voters. If it comes to pass, you need Congress's help on these things, but eventually Congress spends the money. So it's not a bad idea. It's called socialism by the Nero Trump side. It's not. It is government handouts. Uh, transfer payments is the polite term. And that's okay. We Romans did it too. We fed the population of a million, despite the fact that we knew we were creating a, a base of a mob that would be troublesome several times, like the year four emperors. However, I come to the, the matter at hand, which is the campaign. Germanicus, Cleopatra is doing very well on the road. And <clears throat> Nero Trump, I can't get out of my mind that we have two great actors here. I understand one is a former president and the other one is a dead emperor. But still, in their day, they were spectacular. They commanded the stage and won all the prizes. So Nero, is, Nero Trump is frustrated that Cleopatra is getting all this attention. But the calendar, the calendar, Germanicus, it is before Labor Day. And the ceremony for consulship and presidency is... It, doesn't really pay, nobody pays attention until after Labor Day. How do you measure Cleopatra's campaign? Is it triumphant? Is it, is it um, ambitious? Is it cautious? Is it defensive? Is it underfunded? How do you measure it? There are two ways to look at the current uh, presidential contest or contretemps and compare it to Imperial Rome. The first is that, like Imperial Rome, the American president is an emperor, A. B, 
the key element that makes an emperor successful is his capacity to gain legitimacy and thus to create stability and to either appease or buy off or kill any rivals. And therefore, um, what we're seeing today is a kind of contest for legitimacy among different contenders. So you said, uh, as, and I agree, is a year of five emperors, but we have to remember Rome, although we look back on it and see a series of single emperors, was never in fact that. The fact that there was a year of four emperors not only says that imperial succession required contest and competition and conflict, but also that for much of the Roman Empire's time, there was more than one emperor. In other words, most emperors had a co-emperor or junior emperor. And by the end of the third century, with the creation of a tetrarchy, there were two separate emperors and two junior emperors. And this means that the uh, contest for legitimacy, which is necessary because someone has to emerge eventually who has legitimacy, is reflected, I believe, right now in the American presidential contest, which is a conflict between five power centers, uh, although several are emergent, and one is in the steep descent, that's Mr. Biden, but they all represent various configurations of legitimacy in proposition. And uh, Ms. Harris is only one of those. And so the question is, is who will emerge eventually? And here it's an interesting, uh, as a second aspect to Roman imperial politics, to look at the role episodically that women played. You likened um, Ms. Harris to Cleopatra, but there were also several other Roman uh, contenders, women, who were in much the same situation as Ms. Harris. For example, the uh, death of Theoderic uh, in the early sixth century, I believe around 528, led uh, to uh, his daughter, Malaswintha, being the major figure in contention for the legitimacy of what was left of the Western Empire, the Ostrogothic Kingdom. And then in the Byzantine period, there were several uh, women who were empresses, and they all had to prove and secure a legitimate rooting. And so what we're seeing here, especially given the failure of, of Hillary, Clinton is um, a, a, a reconfiguration of how a woman can be turned into a legitimate empress in her own right. And again, hearkening back to Cleopatra or Amala Swintha, they, they were not able to achieve that. Cleopatra failed, and she failed not only in her selection of Mark Antony, but because she was... Uh, she was unable to find constituencies in Italy and among Romans that would support her fully. And that was true of Amala Swintha. And then later, it was a problem for um, Irene and, and, and then even Zoe, because the capacity to, to rule legitimately required assembling constituencies that would support you. What we're seeing now, I think, with Ms. Harris One is, minute, Atticus. One minute. is a very energetic and, and careful, considered effort to put together a, an imperial portfolio of legitimacy that, that a, a, a majority or something close to that can buy off on. And that hasn't happened yet. She has core, a core constituency, just as Mr. Trump does. But to assemble one that will transform her into a legitimate successor to the dying emperor, um, Mr. Biden, is a very tall order. This has been a glorious century for models of empire. We've had every different kind of emperor we can imagine, including the potential for Cleopatra to be part of the empire's executive. 
we called it the court. Uh, and Mark Antony and she planned to take over the whole of the empire, except for a bad day in Actium. We're now looking at where we are in the latter part of the first century AD when Domitian, who was reckless and indifferent to the Senate, fell. He was assassinated is the talk. I don't give that any particular credence. I just mentioned that's what the history books say. Uh, replaced by a, a, a man named Nerva, who was successful but died of a fever in two years. So he was only there 20 minutes as far as the Romans are concerned. And that's not enough time to get letters back and forth three times to the legates guarding the empire. And then the empire was inherited by Trajan, who did a wonderful job from 101 AD, a few years hence to where we are now, till his death in, two eight, in 118, and passed the empire on to Hadrian. They did these things by adopting cousins and relatives and ne nephews. It was very neatly done. Trajan and Hadrian were soldiers. They completely understood the army. They were very uncomfortable in Rome, but they were very successful. And Tra Hadrian took over and ruled until he handed it off to the man who would become Marcus Aurelius in the, 20, in the, in the 130s. So we have a good run ahead of us. And I fancy this question for you, Germanicus. Trajan inherits from Nerva from Domitian, who was despised. Battle-tested legions, great defenses on the Rhine, a full treasury, Rome at peace, a, a million people in Rome, in the city itself, largest city in the solar system, and the confidence of the trade negotiations throughout the Mediterranean basin. We were globalized. Those are roughly things you could say about the American empire today. I know it's relative, but you could say that compared to what, John? Compared to everybody else, even China, the rising power, has a very troubled economy it can't fix. We fix our economy, the Americans do. So when will the Americans enjoy the success they now represent is the question for you, Germanicus. When is enough enough? The Romans had an answer to that, and that was to stop expanding beyond your means. And the first and very abrupt wake-up call to that effect came with Varus and the loss of the three legions in the Teutoburger Wald in 9 AD. And the, the Romans were pushing into Germany because they still felt they had a head of steam from the days of Caesar and the conquest of Gaul. Uh, they stopped after the disaster uh, in 9 AD, and they consolidated. And the one exception, of course, was Claudius' invasion of Britain. And, and Trajan went into Dacia only because Rome was embroiled in wars with them, and he was a stupendous enough general to be able to actually not simply master, but conquer and subjugate the Dacians for, oh, uh, 160 years. Right, they did a Carthage on them. Yeah, they, that was Trajan. You know, Trajan also conquered Mesopotamia. And Hadrian immediately gave that up when he became emperor. All right, you're describing America. Was yeah. it, enough, it was enough for the Romans. When Trajan got back to Rome in 105, right. there, were, there was nothing but celebration. They thought the man... They thought they knew he was a man, not a god, but they thought they had a first rate leader, and they did. There's a lesson here, and that is that under Mr. Biden, because of his age, he was still enraptured by the vision of America as the global hegemon, wow. which of course means global leader. It doesn't mean global conqueror, but it means global leader. And we were no longer up to that. We blew it in the endless wars after 2001, and we blew it by letting our economy de-industrialize for those 20 years. And so now we have an opportunity to do, say, what Hadrian did, or what was done by Augustus after uh, 9 AD, and that's to pull back. 
Does the United States have to be the world hegemon? Right now, in terms of American alliances and areas where the U.S. has a kind of predominant influence, that covers half the world. All the Western Hemisphere, or 90% of it, all of Europe in the form of NATO, and as well, um, Japan, Korea, Australia, the that's half the world, all the Pacific and the Atlantic. In other words, the defenses on the Rhine are secure. They're very strong. The legions are battle-tested. Nobody's <laughs> coming. Nobody was attacking Rome. The Dacians were on their home territory on the Danube, and right. Trajan conquered them. Good for him. He didn't have to. That was just what he thought his job was. Now, is- we don't have to conquer Russia and China. We don't have to do it. This was the hubris of Mr. Biden. And it's tremendous hubris because he was given the Ukraine portfolio by Mr. Obama and he went and ran with it and helped to create this massive mess. And you can look at interviews, just Google, yeah. Google Biden saying, this is America. We're the, the greatest right. power in all history. Well, that has to be recalibrated. And the fact is that Mr. Trump had that kind of revision and retrenchment in his sights and said so. And the question is, can blue, can the new Democrat order that is being formulated now, can it also come to terms with this or not? Will it industrialize that blue temperament? It what? Will it industrialize the blue? I don't know that um, blue today uh, has a coherent strategic vision and a capacity to do a full net assessment. Uh, and for the U.S. to get to the point again where it had uh, a set of legions that were up to a task will require a kind of reindustrializing of American manufacturing, and it will require a, a major investment. And I don't see that happening. So if the U.S. isn't going to rebuild its military, and in large part, it it can't because of the manufacturing decline, but also because of the massive debt, then the U.S. has to retrench. It has to pull back or it faces a calamitous outcome. Germanicus is Michael Vallejos. I am Gaius John Batchelor. We're headed to the theater. You know, Germanicus, I've been thinking about Greek theater, why it makes me despair so much. I think we're getting Antigone tonight. It's so gloomy, and it's it's defeatist. People, are, it's people are always punished. That That isn't how we Romans think. Right. The, our enemies are punished, but not Rome. We're not punished. And we succeed even when we sort of cheat a little bit. Uh, and the Greeks seem to be fascinated by the idea of justice. Is that, that isn't a Roman concern. Property, we concern ourselves with, but we're the might of Rome. The Greeks never enjoyed that for a moment, did they? Might. Well, they have a tragic vision and uh, that Rome never adopted the tragic vision. They adopted everything else the Greeks did. Right. Except that. Yes, we, we, we didn't suffer losers. Germanicus, Gaius, Londinium, 90, well, technically 91 AD, springtime, the fall ahead of us, peaceful, the Thames is a little turbulent, we're headed to the theater after we sacrifice to the great god Augustus. I'm John Batchelor.